ReleaseWire helps businesses connect with interested journalists and bloggers. Check out the link in the description to save 25% on your first press release. Admiral, radar shows that we have liberals approaching at 3 o'clock, and libertarians at 9 o'clock, and conservatives at 6 o'clock. They're coming from every angle, every viewpoint. Oh, it's Political Radar with your hosts, Rhonda and Elliot. Hey, all you political junkies, welcome to Political Radar, the best 30 minutes of unscripted and uncensored political talk you will hear all day. Episode 37. 37? Uh, yeah, we're going to, this is going to be a three hour marathon. Um, it you, could you have potentially a big lineup be, of topics yeah. you wanted to hit, so. We have Eric Wimberger in the studio today. He's running for state senate of Wisconsin. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. Um, we were talking previously about the area that you are going to be possibly representing. It's pretty large. You want to give us a little tour? Sure. Um, each senate district has three assembly districts within it. Um, so the three are the 88th, 89th, and 90th. So that would be uh, John Nigren, Eric Genrick. And John Mako. Uh, it kind of goes from a little south of uh, East De Pere, north, and then uh, skirts around Alloway, includes Bellevue. Uh, covers Green Bay, most of it, <laughs> and then uh, and then goes up north to Marinette. And you've been to every single area, right? Uh, actually, yeah, by now, for sure. A lot of work, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, it's more than you'd think. And the little stuff, you know, putting up. Uh, signs or what have you is uh, time consuming. So why why do you want to do it? Uh, well, I'm Briefly. a I'm a different uh, I'm a different uh, perspective on on how to handle things and than what I've got currently. But this isn't your first time running for office, right? Uh, no, I ran uh, for the assembly two years ago. Okay, and so let's get to the topics. We have a half hour. Um, some really important things happening or not happening in the state right now. Um, we're going to start with marijuana. So. Right now, there are some states, what, 14 states that have actually made it possible to... to we'll, be, we'll be 48th. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Medical marijuana is what's um, out there and that they're able to use it. Michigan just recently had some sort of a, a law that was passed that they can actually... Um, they can, it's not necessarily that you can go and just use it and purchase it, but it's for medical marijuana. It can actually be grown. Businesses are going to modify um, where you can actually... Grow it, sell it, um, regulate it, obviously. Um, but it seems like it's seeping in. It's it's a reality in a lot of states. And there are plenty of states that are actually, they have it on the ballot in November. So when are we going to see some more conversation about that? Uh, are we going to see more conversation about that? I would uh, I would suspect several years from now, even the, the first conversations about it, um, to see what happens in those other states. <laughs> They're... Uh, uh, reaction to uh, to crime or abuse, uh, other societal effects, um, and I'm sure that data will come in, and uh, the world's going to go one way or the other. I imagine. So, do you think that they follow um, Wisconsin with like drunk driving and fatalities with um, alcohol? I mean, it's is it fair to say that because I think obviously we have a you know a significant culture of of drinking. We have been rated what one of the Drunkest. We're one of the top 50 states. Right. I'm confident. Thank you. <laughs> but we are one of the drunkest areas in the country, right? I mean, so I, I, I guess brandy. I'd, like to, I'd like to hear a better argument for that. So do you believe that medical marijuana would be something you could get behind? After right. you put your beer down, could you get behind medical? Right. So the, the I'm an attorney, so I, I do kind of deal with these issues. Um, the, the alcohol you can measure... You just do the breathalyzer in certain circumstances, but uh, the blood draw. Uh, the way you get tagged with a with an OWI with um, with drugs is just uh, with the presence of it in your in your blood. It's difficult to analyze whether someone is quote unquote intoxicated. Uh, there's no strict litmus test like a point oh eight for drugs, so you have to go by the old kind of um, uh, was the person intoxicated, and that's uh, difficult to determine with with whatever sort of field sobriety test you're going to do. But a blood test or having a particular amount of THC in your blood, or 
whatever is uh, is a little difficult. Um, uh, so I don't know if you're going to see a rise in OWIs or something like that because of drugs. Um, uh, there's there there are plenty of uh, people using marijuana around. I guess the statistics are somewhere around 13 percent of the population has used it within the last three months of whatever the statistic is, but it's significant. Uh, and they're, for all intents and purposes, responsible marijuana users, like responsible gun owners. We shouldn't punish the responsible that's, that's a different issue, marijuana but, users. Um, I think uh, from my perspective, the, the issue are, are not so much um, uh, the drug itself um, as it is what's going to happen uh, to people who can't deal with their problems. Um, the when does your problem become my problem, in other words? And from a general sense, a conservative perspective is uh, if, it's, if it's not bothering me, why should I bother you? And we ought to make a system that... Uh, well, that sounds like he's in favor. So we'll, we'll just uh, leave, it, leave it at that. <laughs> uh, we're all pro-marijuana. Uh, we would like to get the tax money, cut my taxes, because I do not indulge in the marijuana, but I would like to allow for you to do that as a responsible adult, in a, in a general sense, I do I do want to have that uh, that bent. However, I think it's too early to tell what um, what's going to happen with uh, a large population uh, using marijuana. And the other thing is the rehabilitative uh, programs that would be needed, and and how that's going to affect the population. I I don't want to see uh, children exposed to such a thing. Um, uh, and have that near near schools or parks or what have you. So I think there's just a lot more research that has to be done analyzing the effects of things, um, and uh, and and what's gonna what's gonna transpire. Um, but I I certainly understand the argument for medical marijuana. Okay, can we progress to because we have? Well, I just want to say that the the entire West Coast it's basically legal, and they haven't fallen into the ocean yet. So that seems pretty solid to me. And there's a lot more population in all those states than we have here. So I, I feel like we have anecdotal evidence. <laughs> we, and we don't have it here, and we haven't fallen into Lake Michigan either. Um, <laughs> I mean, actually, based on our prison population, especially the, the black prison population, we have. Uh, okay, I don't know the statistics. But, it's high. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, we covered that on some earlier episodes, yeah. Okay, so we can move on to the next okay, one. Let's I'm go. sorry. That's not so okay. Um, I'm being the confrontational it's, one now. What it's is kind going of on? The, it, well, and it's an interesting topic because there's quite a bit out there right now on what's happening. Um, like Ohio, Illinois are considering it for November. There's a lot of people considering this right now. I mean, it's a conversation. So are we going to lead? Are we going to follow? What are we going to do? And right? If we follow, we don't get the tax benefits. Exactly. So let's go to voter ID because I think that's another topic of conversation that's pretty um, sure. popular. Um you know, there have been federal judges, you practice law, I'm sure you know this, um, that have looked and they can't find really a, a lot of fraud. So I'm a little conflicted um, on, on this issue because I think that there are arguments for and against it, but let's get some real arguments for this and fraud is not one of them. What do you think about voter ID? Where do you, where do you think this is going? Uh, well, I think I would have to agree with you that the, the studies on the amount of fraud are... Um, uh, not available, the, but the fraud studies that are out there are indicating that of those people caught committing some sort of voter fraud, there is a very very small percentage of those that are manipulating IDs. But that's only those people who are caught and convicted of some sort of voter malfeasance. Um, so you can't really say that the fraud isn't out there. It's only that the people who are caught manipulating the system, a small percentage of those are doing ID fraud. The, the overarching kind of argument for all this is that a perception of an injustice is as detrimental to society as an actual injustice. So if you don't have faith in your election system because there are ways to manipulate it, um, then uh, it it kind of breaks down the integrity of things. How do you do that without, uh, I guess, preventing people from voting or making uh, making it more difficult for people to vote? Well, doesn't it violate the Equal Protection Clause in the Constitution? Uh, you mean simply because 
well, I, I wouldn't say equal protection clause, but uh, your due process potentially, I suppose. Uh, so it's very possible that this actually does violate the con uh, Constitution. I don't think so. It, no. What's going to happen is there's going to be an analysis of who's actually going to be harmed by this. The last election with the voter ID in effect actually showed more voter turnout than in the previous um, gubernatorial election did. So turnout was actually higher. The Do you think that's because of voter ID laws? No, I'm saying that a voter ID a law had no, no effect on it. Right. So uh, what, what you have are a, a few people here and there that lost their birth certificate or something and then can't get the free ID. So uh, troubleshooting that. The only way that the voter ID law becomes un unconstitutional is if there's some sort of uh, 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 disposition or purpose in the law to um, disenfranchise a group of people. And I don't think that's going to be shown in Wisconsin. The people who are um, having trouble voting are not a particular demographic. It's the one-offs here and there that, that can't um, find well, some sort of thing. Uh, we don't have a place to get IDs in the city of Green Bay. So sure, the DMV. That's in Ashwaubenon. Well, okay, right. Well, if you're, if you're not a, a, a vehicle driver and you live in the city of Green Bay, getting to Ashwaubenon is actually kind of a big deal. And uh, they're not open on Sundays. Uh, it's, it's difficult for people who are working three jobs to take care of their family that can't afford a car, don't have a car, whatever, for whatever reason, right? Uh, that is sort of a difficult thing. So what would you do to mediate that? Uh, I wouldn't disagree that some people would have a challenge getting to the DMV when it's open. Okay. But it's not impossible. But what would you do about that? I well, don't think that's an undue burden on people. Really? No. Okay. Um, I think it's an undue burden for me to go there just to be able to drive my car. I think it's ridiculous. <laughs> well, we don't want unlicensed drivers on the street. What about automatic registration? Uh, just because you're alive? The, I don't think the registration necessarily... Um, is uh, as long as you're checking in, presenting whatever you got to do to register, I don't think that's necessarily a problem. Uh, I know from my practice in the law uh, how many, just because I encounter bad dudes from time to time, uh, that there are people who steal Social Security numbers mm -hmm. and, um, and might try to get IDs using the Social Security number. And... Uh, uh, if there's not that secondary level other than presenting a bill with your with your name on it, and I've been here for 30 days, uh, then and showing that you are who you are um, just by saying it, uh, then it, it opens it up to fraud. Um, and how are you going to catch it if a person has uh, it just goes there with a bill with a name on it? So in a nutshell, you're you're you know you're good with what's what's there right now, the laws that are right there. With uh, voter yeah, ID. I I am. No, I'm not. I'm not necessarily satisfied that uh, some people would have a trouble getting an ID. And if that's a bona fide problem, um, then I think we need to help people get get that. So, ID. would you be in favor of uh, police officers in the field being able to issue IDs, or social With workers, like, parole officers? Would these people be able to issue IDs on the road? On the road. Uh, you mean for driver's licenses? Uh, well, an ID. These are people who. It, who aren't driving, that's why they don't have an ID already. Right. You know, whatever method there might be that is that is reasonable in cost. Is this happening somewhere? It's going to happen here because otherwise this is insane. Like we, So we're keeping people from voting just like we keep people from the election, uh, the presidential election debate floor. <laughs> and it's, it's anti-democratic and there's, there's no reason to do it. Uh, maybe the burden isn't that hard, but I don't know why we have to have any. Is there an actual conversation happening about that? Though I just started one. Okay. Yeah. No, well, and I've talked about it before. And nobody's. But the, but the there's reason why been, we can't do that. There's always been a burden in voting. You have to go to your polling location. Yeah, but that's in your neighborhood. Well, you're talking then a, a matter of distance. Absolutely. So yeah. if if you can so get, if on, I have to walk five miles. If you can versus get on walking a bus, two blocks, you can get on a bus. Okay, so now I'm I'm dependent on public transportation, which which exists. Ours is uh, relatively mediocre. Well, it exists. Yeah. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist everywhere. And if you wanted a license, you had to pay for gas and your car insurance yeah. and all that. Yeah, so, I mean these burdens are not onerous. 
Um, well, if I want a license to drive, that's a little bit different. We're talking about people who can afford a vehicle and who are going to, you know, they, they need, they need to get a driver's license for driving, not voting. Like voting is different. It's separate. Um, All right. So let's move on because yeah. we have a half hour. Let's talk about sex. Okay. And education, because I think this is something that is out there. Um, we've had some conversation about this um, before on the podcast. Um, why should we continue to spend any time, energy, amount of money with abstinence education in Wisconsin? Uh, with abstinence education? Yeah, because right now the law was changed recently that abstinence will be the, you know, you're going to focus on abstinence and then, you know, you know other, you know, things on, on, the, on the back burner. But that's what's there right now. In the state of Wisconsin, if you're in a public school, you are being directed to be abstinent. And we know that's not necessarily the best case. To well, be. uh, single parenthood or having a child too early uh, are one of the, the easiest ways to fall behind in your life. Right, the, but that's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is why are we spending time on abstinence? Because let's take... New Mexico and Mississippi, they have abstinence only. So actually, it's not even required to talk about that in school, but it's abstinence only if it is. And they have the highest teen pregnancy rate in the country. Uh, but I don't think we're talking about only. Right. But why would we have that as something that the law did change? So why are we having that actually that it's out there? It's something that should be you know, promoted. Well, the other ways are not 100%. Abstinence is probably 100% to solve whatever sort of uh, problem there. Um, to, I mean, it seems obvious, but one of the ways to not get yourself into uh, doing bad behavior is to not do it. Okay, but if you're not, if you're a human being and you're, you're, human, you're a sexual human being, which most people are, right? Especially teenagers. Especially teenagers. Um, and we're working with reality. Again, when we look at the numbers and the statistics and the data, it tells us that if you are promoting abstinence in your state, you have high teen pregnancy rates. So why are we spending money doing this in Wisconsin? Well, I would disagree about that any sort of statistic that way because there was a long period of time in the Victorian age where it was the only thing and it was completely chastised and, and teen pregnancy was not very high. Um, now, that's not the reality we live in today, um, but you can't just say that uh, those statistics of a particular state because they have absence only is the cause because that, that doesn't make any sense historically. But it's not helping them. A, a combination of all these things is probably the best way to go. Okay, so in, also in the current laws, um, in the curriculum of, of public schools in Wisconsin, the, they talk a lot about really trying to push the issue of marriage. And so I'm so confused because I have always been under the assumption that Republicans do not want marriage and government together. But all of a sudden, we have to have marriage on the table in the curriculum of schools. And let's be real, um, you know, in my public school, there was a handout sent out that talked about, um, you know, living together is not appropriate. Single parenthood is not appropriate. Um, so you have children reading this. Okay, let, th this is not something that's, you know, the handout reflected like something from 1952. Let's be real. Why are we talking about marriage as well? When all, most Republicans, I can't imagine would disagree with this, do not want government and marriage in the same sentence. So why is it there? Why is it in the law? Why there, is it literally a law? There is only marriage because of government. Okay. You have to, there's two dynamics going on at the same time. There is whether your religious institution is going to recognize you as married, but that is quite significantly different than whether your government recognizes a marriage or particular status of union between two people. It's like recognizing you as a corporation. Once the government does recognize that union, then all the tax benefits, the what's called intestate succession, uh, all the, the, the documents with wills and all those things uh, are going to apply to that union. Uh, so government is the reason that marriage is an issue. If government were tomorrow to not even recognize marriages, 
Uh, they could do that. They, yeah, but this is in a health class. This isn't in a business education sure. class or so in the, a, in the a dynamic, well, I think, class. I think the different thing is a marriage and government are intertwined. Um, what uh, what I think the debate is how people should behave and whether they should get married are, is a different thing. And that's actually, would you disagree with this? No, that, that's no. I would wouldn't. you Would you disagree that that's coming from religious institution? Well, religion is how the concept of marriage. Okay, are, but but let's but be the, real. We don't get any resources from religion in our state. Yeah, well, or schools. The 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 first time marriage was really recognized by a government was uh, Octavian in in Rome and whatever it was, A.D. 70. And that was to promote a system where two people would get together and have a family because the burden of a community dealing with all these, um, all these unattended children was so high that you could assign two people to take care of kids by promoting tax um, uh, uh, breaks and things like that for people who decided to stick together. So that's been a tradition for a long time in Western culture. Um, in a the, church. In, well, yeah, and, and correspondingly, of course. In so church. with religion, with regards to religion. Well, the, the thing we do in education is promote values in K-12. through We're promoting our society. Can they values. promote it with some tax resources, do you think? Uh, for what? For public schools. To promote it. I mean, if you're going to promote marriage. a religious agenda, can we get some tax money from these people? Well, I don't think it's a religious agenda. It, to have to have two people that take care of a child is easier than if one person takes care of a child. Oh my god, I completely disagree because I have not experienced that. If there are two people who are assigned to taking care of a child, it is easier than if one person is assigned to taking care of the child. So to promote that sort of a dynamic by giving a, a some sort of a tax credit, or to have some sort of sharing arrangement within the law, is uh, is something that um, is going to result in the child being taken care of, and a less burden on people whose child it is not. So you agree that we should be discussing marriage and health class? Sure, of course. But not okay. in business class. Uh, well, maybe in tax. But uh, the, the concept, though, is to, is to say, look, life is going to be easier for you if you have two people on board uh, with the program having a child and taking care of the child. Now, that doesn't work out all the time. You know, people get divorced, or they, or it's a half uh, the time they get divorced. Yeah, so it so doesn't it usually doesn't, doesn't work out. It doesn't work out, <laughs> right? But, uh, but whether the whether the attitude should be this is what you should strive for in life is to get with somebody who you care about, and if you're going to start a family, then the two caring people can and do uh, you th- develop do you that. think that's that a good way to go? Like a public school health class is the appropriate avenue to take to talk about marriage. Uh, if it's talk in the concept of procreation and how to hand, handle best uh, when to have kids, how to have kids, I think it's very important to instruct people, children, on how others have succeeded in being successful in life. And one of those ways is to have a very stable life in a stable family. Uh, and that's uh, that's a component. What if what if I'm a single but, parent but and I'm divorced time, and I actually have a child who's sifting through this handout and this she's thinking, wow, my mom's divorced. What's wrong with my family? Um, why is that okay? Uh, I'm not saying past judgment, but but uh, that handout in the public school system. I, I haven't seen the I've well, seen right? But I guess per the law. It's okay to actually have that out there. Your school board is going to decide what gets submitted to kids. Yeah, of course. Do you think, what would you do if you were elected? Do you think that you would um, continue to champion this type of law where we have abstinence is really the main focus and then marriage? Do you think this is doing a service to our public school children or our school children in general? Do you think this law was fair? Do you see any changes? Would you be open to that? Well, the the whole to promote a stable family life and having people around you who can take care of the child is not only beneficial to the child but beneficial to the society as a whole. Uh, so, in the in the way we deal with things, we don't have three people taking care of a child or four. 
uh, it's ingrained in our culture and in our and in our laws uh, because of how we handle death and wills and intestate succession uh, with when someone dies without a will. Uh, it's a big word. I I'm sorry. Um, uh, to have two people taking care of a child is the way that we we handle things. Um, you can, if you're a single parent and one person isn't paying child support, you can, you can go into the family court and require them to pay uh, for, for things. So, you know, under penalty of going to jail for contempt. So these things are ingrained as having parents taking care of their children. I think it ought to be promoted. Now, the, the telling people one is good or bad, I don't know. That's for someone to, to judge themselves. But when you promote something, you are implicitly saying it's good. Well, right. What about? I mean, you you could flip the coin and say the other things that are put into sex education are things that there are, some conservatives might not want. Okay, so there are. So they would be. What would they be against? I don't know, but you hear you hear stories all the time about how uh, one thing or another, this particular practice or another, is something that. Um, that a conservative would have an issue with. But those are individual health choices, not a reflection on your existing or future family. Well, you're viewing it from that perspective, correct. But the yeah. uh but what that's why it's in a health class. Like your health is about you and your body and how you are handling yourself. Whereas these other things, those are those are business issues, really. They're like they're legal business issues. So I don't dispute what you're saying. Is it other tax benefits, other uh, inheritance benefits, and all sorts of structural, business, legal reasons to 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 say, hey, marriage might be so a good your, idea. Your real your real question is, it's really the same uh, thing as getting. Why a, would health class not focus on anything except for health? Um, correct. Okay. Yeah. Well, then I I don't know what particular curric- curriculum requirements are in. A, yeah. a sex I mean, ed class. And now. the other thing is, this wouldn't bother me so much, but uh, this is like 12-year-olds, 15-year-olds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. These aren't 17, 18-year-olds, right? So they're very uh, impressionable about these things. And uh, you may think that's an advantage in promoting uh, a marriage agenda, but um, you know, kids don't think of things like in a straight line always, right? So they're going to interpret things the way they interpret them, and they're going to talk to their friends, and they're going to see their own family situation and, you know, uh, some schools have almost all of the parents in a divorced situation. So what, some, is that, some what does that par- do then? Some children have um, yeah. two lesbians that are their parents. How do you feel about that? Whatever. <laughs> okay. That's that, a good answer. That is a good answer. All right. Let's quickly yeah. move to jobs because obviously it's Wisconsin. Yeah. Um, we're not doing so hot. Um, what are you going to do to change that? Well, I wouldn't say we're not doing so hot. Uh we have what a four point something unemployment rate. Um, the uh, the labor force participation rate in Northeast Wisconsin is actually about four or five points uh, better than the national average. So you can't say it's not going that hot. Um, we lost twelve thousand jobs since May. Well, okay, how. I, I mean, are those the, are those the so, companies that are actually moving out of state? Because what is going on with that? But what, what's that stat, though? What, where'd you get that from? From the Wisconsin, the Bureau of, I wrote it, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Okay. Yeah. So you have places like Brilliant who just are moving. Yeah. Man, to walk. Why do you think that's happening? I mean, it seems to be kind of a, well, they, a hot thing right uh, now. There, there's, there, well, there's two companies in our area that left. Manitowoc is one. The Manitowoc Company built an expansion in Pennsylvania because they got a good deal on the land and taxes. They overbuilt the size of the building, okay, to incorporate because they were going to get um, uh, their benefit to do that. And then they had an empty building. So it gave them the option whenever they decided to pull the trigger to move over to to Pennsylvania. Um, How do you stop that? You create a better business environment. I mean, there was a to move an entire plant um, over there was uh, an incredible feat uh, financially, and the only reason they were able to accomplish that is because to re uh, retool or rework their existing plant was going to cost less to them than moving building a new one in in Pennsylvania. What's the tax rate in Pennsylvania compared no to Wisconsin? But they but they built that facility. 
uh, for those reasons. There's only one reason why you would do that, um, because it's cheaper. The the one in Brill, the, cons- the construction is cheaper. I would build say the construction the, is cheaper. The land sale was was a better or the ta- or the tax well, they, structure. They made a business case for it. So I mean, even if or the tax structure, we don't know what the tax numbers are. It was probably a combination of all those things. But I can't I can't imagine that the that the labor in in Pennsylvania is any cheaper than the labor here. I mean, it's uh, manufacturing is going to be whatever. It's so what are you going to do to switch that? Because it's happening quite a bit. Yeah. And it's well, the other out there. the other the other business was the was the Brilliant the Ironworks. Um, they left because they sp- specifically said there's a drop in, um, in heavy equipment and mining. So that's, that is, can be perceived, I think very rationally as a direct result of us not opening the mine up North for good or bad, but that would be the direct result. There's not, uh, there's not a reason to have a plant here, a foundry. Um, and unfortunately that's just the way it panned out. So all these things uh, kind of intertwine, but two different companies, I think, two different reasons why they might have why they might have left. It would have been beneficial for uh, the mining equipment to stay in this area if there was a mine, and there's there's not. Uh, and and as far as the crane company, you know, these cranes are sold are sold worldwide. So I think at this point they're looking just as a a cost structure. Um, but how do you do that? You just have to make an environment here that. Um, is conducive to production. I understand the race to the bottom on taxes. If you, if uh, if one state has the zero taxes, then all of them, in order to to compete, have to have those zero taxes. And I get that. But the other the other um, uh, avenue you got to take is to make sure that uh, the things we're teaching young adults in either the tech schools or the colleges are actually geared to becoming productive citizens and reflect the need in the community or in the world. So companies would come here because when they're analyzing their cost structure, they're going to see that if they hire someone here in Northeast Wisconsin, they're going to get someone who's intelligent and is going to be dynamic and is going to make the company money. Okay. So the so the actual um, the environment, you said the business environment, um, isn't it, would it be fair to say that it, the Republican legislature has driven that? I mean... I would think the the measures that were passed for tax relief breaks, corporate welfare, however you want to word that, um, in the state of Wisconsin, it was led by the Republicans. So did well, they not do their job for six for six years? So did they not do their job? I think they did the best they could under the circumstances, but the state was in a genuine deficit by the time uh, the Republicans took everything in in two thousand and ten. And when you're talking about uh, decisions that a company's going to make that are tens of millions of dollars or even a billion dollars um, long term, uh, those things are made five, six years in advance. So uh, how do you stop the ball from rolling when when Manitowoc has already built their plant in Philadelphia? Are there any any corporations or companies that were given tax breaks from um, Governor Walker that left the state? I have no idea. Because I believe there are. I, I wouldn't doubt it. You know, it's it's a it's not it's not like some sort of magic bullet. A tax incentive is not a magic bullet. So, uh, so do you think that the what you said the keep the ball from rolling? Do you think that we've done that now? Do you think yeah more balls are going to keep rolling, or do you think that we're going to be able to push the ball back uphill? Um, the ones that have uh, it's not as if Manitowoc is suddenly going to build a company over here or build a plant over here now. That's, that's I think that ship sailed. Um, well, so, I mean, a lot of those are but, low skill and semi-skilled workers, right? And so your earlier point about uh, making sure we're training people for the jobs of today and tomorrow correct. is apt. So, so it, it, would, it would have to be a dynamic where either small businesses or manufacturers could start up. Um, it's probably going to be more techno- technologically driven um, and, uh, and us to have workers that are prepared uh, with uh, intelligent training, so you would maybe invest that. more in tech tech schools. Is that what you're thinking? Uh, sure. Like for instance, um, you got Renko Machine down the down the road. Sure. Um, I've had a chance to go over there. They used to do some mass production of uh, parts, of metal parts, but just the way things go, uh, it's it's um, cheaper to make 
make things in China, for instance. So to have a manufacturing um, is just not going to be functional. So now they do. They transitioned into making very specialized parts, and they're doing very well at it. So you have workers there who are running these you know, 10 or $15 million CNC machines or what have you, and, uh, uh, and having, I don't think there's going to be someone in China who's going to be able to run a CNC machine and make it cost effective, for instance. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so do you think we need to cut taxes more or is, are we good? It's a, it's a balancing. I, I mean, that's, that's such a broad question. You got to pay for stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but my, my general philosophy on the world is that um, a tax is a cost. Mm-hmm. You know, I have, um, my, I have my, my law practice is a small business, and, um, and my folks have a candy store up in Lakewood if you ever go there. So we have in the summertime, we try to get 15 employees, and, um, and we have all the, the other things that come along with a small business. So I know that, uh, that your, your taxes are going to be something built into your price, um, and, uh, and that, that cost is going to be reflected. So every time there's an increase in uh, a tax, uh, that means increased prices, and then if there's a competitor overseas, you know, how, then you get priced out of the market. For, uh, for us in uh, northern Wisconsin, what that means is, in, in our business in northern Wisconsin, in a retail situation, is that maybe people don't go on vacation there as much, okay? And that, that affects because it would cost too much to do this and to do that. Um, and, and they're not going to go up there and buy candy. It, it, it turns into a situation like, uh, like Door County where it's only kind of a, you know, a different demographic that can vacation up there reasonably. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's all about balance, um, what your goals are in accomplishing things. I just don't think that government is necessarily the solution for everything. Um, and in fact, it, uh, every year I think we ought to look at, um, at what government is doing uh, and making sure that the taxes we are using and revenue and there's ex- uh, that there's actually a specific purpose for the, for the thing um, and not just Hey, let's uh, let maybe the answer is to spend more money. Um, I like a I like a genuine plan and to be efficient. Is that your closing statement? I guess I I, I really didn't uh, say who I was. I don't think to your audience. But, well, go ahead. Uh, yeah, and and also uh, how they can get in touch with you if they want more information. Sure. Uh, so uh, I grew up in East Up here. Um, went to uh, Saint Cloud State uh, in Minnesota, and uh, and then after. After college, I drove a semi for for Schneider National here, and saved up for about thirty seconds of law school. Uh, after law school, I joined the Marines. I was a, jag, a judge advocate in the Marine Corps, and then came home and set up my my law practice. So, like I said, we got a uh, my family has a, a candy store up north, and um, and I know all about the small business needs um, and. Uh, and what it means to kind of struggle. I have student, I have student loans like everybody else. Um, but uh, I hope to uh, to persuade everybody that I'm a good guy to vote for in November. And you're running against Dave Hansen. Correct. Yep. Mm-hmm. So make things better for small business. I think that'll make everybody happy. Right. the I- the different the different uh, t- the different tactic that we would the, to differentiate myself. You saw what happened in 2008 and 2006 when my opponent was uh, uh, in, the, in the leadership in his party, which is take the, the funds, the rainy day funds, the, uh, the road fund, and spend it to try and do a stimulus. That didn't work. Uh, and because relying on Keynesian multiplier is like hoping fairy dust works. So the Keynesian multiplier in his economic plan or our concept didn't pan out like it didn't pan out anywhere. And, uh, and then we're left with debt and also um, uh, no rainy day fund or any sort of fund to pay for roads. We're paying for that now uh, with uh, deterioration in, in a whole lot of areas. Um, and my tactic would just be different, which would be some fiscal soundness, making sure that... Uh, um, that government has its specific purpose. Um, I don't believe in a stimulus in the fact of borrowing in order to uh, maybe 
conjure some sort of um, uh, uh, economic development, but rather when people keep more of their own money um, that they earn, it makes people produce more because the more the harder they work, the more they're going to get. And that stimulates people to be more productive. And it's that production uh, that will drive the economy and increase the tax base. And that'd be my different, uh, the different difference between me and my opponent, I think. Okay. Well, you were brave enough to come on. So far, uh, your opponent has not been here. So I feel like you have a, a good, solid leg up there. How, if somebody wants to get more information on you and what, what your beliefs are, uh, where would they go? Sure. It's, uh, it's uh, votewimberger.com. W-I-M, as in Mike, B as in Bravo, E-R-G-E-R. Uh, and, uh, or uh, I, I'm sure you'll find me on Facebook, too. Okay, that Thank wraps you. up episode number 37 of Political Radar. Uh, to read some show notes, go to politicalradar.com slash 37. Uh, you can hunt us down in the usual places in the uh, Political Radar community on Facebook, on Facebook, on Twitter, all over the place. Uh, please go onto iTunes and anywhere that you find this podcast like YouTube and leave a review and tell your friends about it. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Wimberg. Hey, thanks for, for having me. Here. Thanks for coming on. Yep. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Political Radar. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. To stay up to date, visit politicalradar.com or connect with us on Facebook or Twitter.